You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Rysinski and I, Nils Kostolarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to keep you focused and inspired to continue your rules-based investing journey. And for those of you who are newer to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to check out the back catalog and listen to some of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Jerry Parker, where we covered a lot of ground and who by my Twitter followers at least were described as being on fire during the episode. So you definitely don't want to miss that one. Mark, it's great to have you back this week. How are you doing? How are things where you are? Good. It's a little cold out here in Massachusetts, so uh, hopefully I could warm up your listeners. I don't know if I'm going to be on fire, <laughs> but but I'll try my best to uh, tell you what I'm thinking about for the first month of the year. Absolutely. And, uh, and what a week to finish the first month of the year. That certainly sent a lot of things on fire, so to speak. Certainly, truly extraordinary events in, the, in a few single stocks like GameStop, AMC, just to name a few. And that has sent some shockwaves through the financial system. Now, for those of you who don't follow these up until recently relatively unknown stocks, a stock like GameStop, which has become kind of the poster child for this war between quote-unquote hedge funds on one side and so-called private investors or Reddit groups on the other side, closed around $19 by mid-January. But then since... It has traded as high at $483 on what can only be described as a massive short squeeze. And the other one, AMC, closed around $2 in early January, and that moved up to $20 or more this week in a similar uh, short squeeze panic. And by the way, according to some news wires that I caught my eye this morning, one of the bulls in this group of of so-called private investors uh, who goes under the name Roaring Kitty is apparently a Massachusetts financial advisor, so not far away from you, Mark. And I know we are going to talk much more about this in our conversation today, but I think what is important to understand is the impact on investor psychology and behavior from what we've seen this week, where people see stocks of real companies can go to silly prices, which may lead people to believe that prices don't really mean anything. And where you can take almost bankrupt companies to huge paper valuations. None of this is real, and it may well have a negative impact on the very foundation of what the marketplace we have to express our views in terms of investing, whether or not this can be fully trusted anymore. But much more about this later. Clearly, these events have had some impact on the markets we trade, And we did see some corrections in the prevailing trends in the many of the markets this week, actually, which meant the trend followers in general went from being up nicely earlier this month to probably finishing, I would say, flat, meaning plus minus 2% is my guess. But I want to bring you in, Mark, early just to touch on some of the things that might have caught your attention outside what we're going to talk about later in terms of markets um, before we dig into what will be a little bit more of a deep dive into my model trend following portfolio. Sure. There's a few things that are really catching my attention. Uh, Obviously, the uh, COVID numbers are critical. The question is, how do you use those numbers if you're a systematic trader? How can you translate that into something that are signals? Second is is, is that uh, there's been uh, much more talk, and I've been studying a little bit more, this idea that uh, commodities are ready to move into a super cycle. Mm -hmm. They come very infrequently, yet uh, we'll say a lot of the market pundits at the the end of the year said, we got to start buying commodities because they're going to start, we're at the beginning of a super cycle. So I think it's always good to sort of study what that means. And then finally, of course, this is that what is going on as we move through this business cycle. So we've had a lot of factor rotation at the end of last year, especially, and some of that has been very disruptive for those who trade alternative risk premium. 
One in particular was the November momentum meltdown. So the question comes in is that why do these meltdowns occur? What should you do about them? And how can you take advantage of them? So those yeah. are a few things that I've been looking at and, and focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have a long list of really great topics for today. Thanks to you, Mark. So I'm excited about that. Now, before we go to those, I want to just uh, run through the performance of this trend following model portfolio that I've been talking about the last month or so. And thanks for all the messages that I've received where people seem to express that that's actually something that they value. So I'm going to keep doing that and see if we can even improve upon it at some point. But for my trend following model portfolio, it was a healthy down week, so to speak, down about 5% in the last week, which actually led to a uh, loss of about 1.75% for the month. So from being up nicely, we actually saw the month ending at a negative note. Now, the performance distribution between the three groups of models in the, in the system was really that most of the loss came from group one kind of classical trend models. They were down about 1.5%. The quote-unquote discretionary type uh, trend following models were pretty flat for the month and then the fast reacting group three models were down about seven uh, sorry 25 basis points making up to the 1.75 percent in terms of sector attribution energy did best up about a percent followed by grains up 40 bips and the worst sectors this month was currencies which lost two percent followed by equities and precious metals which actually both lost about 40 basis points, and the rest of the sectors were pretty flat. If we drill down to single markets, the best markets were heating oil and 10 US 10-year notes, as well as Brent. And then on the bottom of the scale, we find the yen, the euro, and gold. In terms of changes in exposure for the week, we did see early on quite a lot of reduction and even I think some of the shorter models went short the DAX. So uh, I, I don't think there's any long positions left in the DAX. And also we saw reductions in markets like cocoa, copper, yen. I think the system is out of all its long yen positions by now. And also palladium uh, reduction in that. And then we saw at the end of the week, we saw some reduction further in the Swiss market index, SMI, and the Nikkei. So lots of exposure reduction during the week, mainly in the equity sector. And also to give you an idea in terms of the overall riskiness of the portfolio, I talk about this measure, risk to stop. So if all the positions were stopped out on Monday, what would the loss be? And we are now down to 7.73%, which is about half of what we saw last week and it's about a third of what we saw early in the month. So it's interesting to see how the stops are getting much closer to current prices, whether it's because prices move down or stops move up, I can't remember, but it is certainly worth noticing that uh, at this date. But overall, a relatively small loss after a very strong 2020 where the model was up about 35%. All right. Now, before we move on to some questions that came in, one in particular from Jono, I think we need to dive into the events of this week, Mark, and you've shared some great talking points uh, with me that I would love that we try, uh, try and tackle sort of one by one. But maybe, maybe before we start, you should kind of set the scene, if you wouldn't mind, in terms of this week and all of the things that will lead to the topics we're going to talk about. Okay, to, uh, to set the scene, we're going to go back to the 1700s. Great. So, and <laughs> we're going we're going way back in time. Perfect. And uh, I'm gonna I pulled out a quote from Isaac Newton when he was talking about the uh, South Sea bubble. He said, "I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people." And so this is Isaac Newton saying this. Uh, uh, he lost a fair amount of money in the South Sea bubble. We have bubbles that have gone on for uh, centuries. And it's almost as though that you want to crack out some of your old books on the topic just to realize that you'll have a lot of new services that said what happened in, at GameStop was unprecedented. Never before happened. AMC, I can't believe this ever happened. 
Yet we've had this happen many times before, even in the last decade. So it's time to bring out your extraordinary popular delusions in the madness of crowds. By Mackie, best author, historian on uh, on this is Charles Kindleberger and panics and, and crashes. We got to start to talk about Nobel Prize winner Robert Schiller. But even more recently, in the last year, there's been a good book by uh, William Quinn and John Turner called Boom and Bust. And I think that that's a, it's a, it's a good way to start with some of these things, because I think when you see these, these unprecedented events, you got to put some structure around it. You have to sort of say, is there a model to explain how some of these things go on? And, and I think that when you dig down deep, you can see that I can't understand how all of this began but I could see how it accelerates and you could see how some of the actions taken uh, make make sense. So now in the the boom and bust book, they actually talk that uh, to get a bubble, you need three things. It's almost like a triangle. Okay. First, you need marketability. And what you've seen in the market and marketability means you have the ability to trade some asset so that it can be able to form a bubble. And we see this with Robinhood. You can now go on your, your your iPhone. You could click on and buy fractional shares. You could buy one share of GameStop. So all of a sudden, you have a tremendous amount of marketability. You have Schwab, Fidelity, some of the other large brokerage firms. They ch- don't charge any brokerage fees whatsoever. So now you have the ability to be able to, uh, if you want to call it the oxygen, for setting up a fire for a bubble because these things are marketable. If if you had to buy 100 shares at a time, if there was brokerage costs, then a lot of retail investors would not be allowed to be able to do this. Second, you need leverage and credit. So there has to be cheap money, and that cheap money has to be able to be put to use somewhere. And then that's the reach for uh, risky assets because you can't get uh, a risk-free asset that's worth anything. And a perfect example we could go back to the uh, old author of The Economist and Financial Times, William Bagholt, and he said that uh, John Bull, the great investor, is that he can handle a lot of things, but he can't handle when uh, the risk-free rate is below 2%. Then you're going to have to reach for risky assets. Right. Finally, you have to have some speculation, and these message boards have allowed for more speculation because people can get quick information, they can get on their phone, they can make take action immediately. So you see that the, that we've been set up in a system where something like this could have happened. You couldn't say it was going to be GameStop. You couldn't say it was going to be AMC, but you had all of the stars aligned. You had all the p- pieces of the triangle for a melt up. That means also we can have a, a, a meltdown. The difference here is this is that Usually when we talk about regulators coming in and the Fed coming in and central banks coming in uh, for uh, bubbles, it's always been associated with the market as opposed to a market. And the problem with the Fed is always faced in, with all regulators is, is that, well, what exactly is the definition of a bubble? In some sense, you could think of it like pornography. You know, I know it when I see it, uh, that there's a view that a bubble is when prices deviate from fundamentals. So, and in some cases, you could say, well, what is the fundamental value of a stock? And it's harder to d- determine when you have a zero interest rates because you want to discount future cash flows. Well, the discount rate is now zero or negative. So, so that means whatever predictions in the future are all being, being brought forward. But in general, is it? Our view is is that we could probably understand the value of an individual stock better than the market as a whole. So what's the value of the market? That's harder to determine. What's the value of a currency? A little bit harder to determine. If you say an individual stock, I can look to the balance sheet, I can look to the fundamentals, I can look to this cash flows, I can discount those, and I should have some idea what the fundamentals, so you'd expect that that gap shouldn't be as large is what we'd see for the market as whole. In this case, the things have gotten a little bit out of hand. <laughs> yeah. So just going back to some of the things where you said that there was a it, it require three or four things in order to for there to be a bubble. Does it also require 
and I use this word carefully, some kind of conspiracy or or not? Well, I think if you go back to Charles Backey and the, the extraordinary popular delusions, we always want to look for a narrative. We want to look for some some story that could provide logic to the things we see around us. And I think that that's one of the key works that Robert Schiller is working on right now. He wrote a recent book called uh, Narrative Economics. Mm. So when we have things we can't explain, we always want to look for a story. And if we can't explain it logically, we got to say, well, <laughs> I, I think right now we're going to say, it's got to be a conspiracy. Right. Wow. And I think that if uh, the conspiracy can come in many forms, it generally is, is that it used to be at one time in currency, Swiss gnomes. It used to be Wall Street. Now it's retail investors. So we would like to always create a specter or a, uh, a someone to blame on something like this. It seems sort of natural that we want to sort of say there are good and, and bad people involved in this. The interesting part is, is, is that uh, when you think of speculation, we always think of the morality play of what we should learn or why this is bad. But it, that has been turned upside down in this case, relative to what we've seen in the past. Now, I, I and I, there's so much to unpack, and I know there are many more points that I'm sure you want to address, but let me just sort of, again, stay with some of the initial things that you've mentioned. You mentioned this thing about marketability, and now you can buy, you know, a fraction of a share or one share. Now, generally, I would say that's a good thing, right? I mean, you don't want to restrict ownership of shares to the rich, to, in lack of a better word, right? Democratizing financial markets, just like, you know, we're trying to democratize to some extent the hedge fund industry by having these episodes every week so people can get an insight as to what really goes on and so on and so forth. So, so that side of things I initially don't see as a negative. I actually think that's a positive. This is also why I was thinking whether you need some kind of conspiracy where these people gang together because one individual on their own, they are obviously not going to move the market. So that's one th one side of things. I'm also curious why you might think this is happening now. Why? Is, I mean, I don't know if you have thought about it, but why do you think this is happening now? Right. Well, you know, actually, I'm all for marketability. I think that it, it's great because it democratizes finance in a way that right. didn't happen before. You know, right. the democratization of finance is an ongoing theme that's been occurring for years and years. In fact, it, it used to be that you couldn't even get consumer credit back in the 1950s. And, and one of the great ways to democratize credit was just the fact that people could have credit cards and, and use a credit card. The fact that now you can be able to buy fractional shares if you're a small investor is great. We'll sort of say one of the key reasons why the gap or of inequality has increased around the world is that wealthy people have access to stocks and other in investment vehicles that uh, less wealthy people don't have. By allowing democratization of finance and marketability of securities, then people have that opportunity to be able to buy fractional shares. They can be able to make stock purchases at a low price where the transaction costs aren't prohibitive. I think that ETFs is a great way to democratize finance and make it more marketable. So I think these are all good things, but like a lot of things, this is that it may be good on balance you take it to the extreme and you could have problems. Sure. Do you think that there is a bigger thing going on here, so to speak, that this is just, I mean, you know, on one side, and I don't, I, you know, I haven't spent the whole week studying this, but on one side you could say, okay, here's a group of probably smart people who are not so private or retail uh, at the call who came up with a great idea and started to execute on that idea and they just happened to get lots of people in on it, and so here's the result. Or you could say that this is much more a um, an expression of the divide we've seen build up in society in the last few years, which we know all too well 
just looking at some of the things that's happened in the US in the last few months, in the last few years. I mean, do you have a view on whether it's kind of one or the other? Well, you know, at some level, this is, is that you like to have this all pushed down so that there's more marketability for investors. At the same time, it is scary because all investors don't have the same level of knowledge. So they may be using message boards as the key theme to be able to make investments. They're not all sure of the rules of the game, what happens if there's a margin change. And I think that what, what we find with all of finance is, is that when you dig into the details, you find out that there are a lot of things that will surprise you that you didn't know. Like for this week, I think that there's probably more people have spent time looking at how clearinghouses work for stocks <laughs> and what the impact will be. And I, I think that, uh, I always think there's there's a number of type of risks that people take when they engage in finance. One would be the risk of volatility of the underlying asset that they buy. But there's also the risk of uncertainty of not knowing the rules. We'll call it the risk of ignorance. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that these investors are stupid, but you find out is, is that if you don't read all the fine print associated with any investment and in how your brokerage uh, account works, you can, you can be surprised and you find out that you may not be able to do the things that you thought you could do once there you get to a market extreme. Yeah, and um, just again, sort of talking uh, bullet points here, but I mean, is this just, you know, if you think about the role of the Fed in the last 25 years, making it seemingly impossible to lose money on equities for too long because they will come out with some kind of bailout and, and so the, the uh, quote-unquote Bernanke put and Greenspan put and whatever determination they've been given. How much of the responsibility do they have in this coming to being expressed now? Well, they've abrogated their responsibility, albeit is, is, is that they, they've implicitly said that one of their key mandates of the Fed is to stabilize financial markets. So in some senses is that when whenever there's destabilization, we know that they'll come in and intervene. So we've had every Fed chairman has now had the Fed put named after them. We started with Greenspan, we got the Bernanke, we got the Yellen put. And when you think about behavior, this changes the behavior for many investors because they'd say is that they may not say explicitly, I've got protection at 20% down, but they know that if the market overall sort of has, has a declines, I know that the Fed will probably come in and, and be able to protect us. They'll actually buy, uh, buy ETFs, they'll buy stocks, they'll buy bonds, they'll do whatever they have to do to stabilize financial markets. If you do that, that after, say, a number of decades, that internalizes into the behavior of investors is that even as a uh, taking back to a trend follower or a systematic manager is that you know that in some sense is that you have to sort of understand that the behavior in markets going up is going to be different than the markets going down and part of this has been internalized by the fed and i think that while i don't always agree with it it will say that for the post great financial crisis period for trend followers and even before that in the decade of 2000, I remember going into the office of one uh, trend-following allocator, and he had a picture of uh, Alan Greenspan on a dartboard. <laughs> he said, okay. he, says, "He said, I play darts with Alan Greenspan because every time that you know he he comes in and the Fed sort of you know bails out the economy, then I know that I'm not going to get the big dislocations that a trend follower needs to be able to make money." So. Yeah we've internalized that behavior. And in some sense, I use the phrase, this is like that movie in uh, Apollo 13. This is that failure is not an option. <laughs> yeah. This is what the Fed is telling us. And yeah. so you can have a sophisticated view, but if you're a retail investor, you could say, is, is that, well, look, the government is going to bail out the stock market. I can play for the upside. You know, I've got this implicit call option I could be able to play and I'm going to use it and behave accordingly. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and also, I guess a lot of people, and again, going back to maybe the role of the regulators, and I don't know what the answer is, of course, but maybe you can't help 
thinking that a lot of the wrongdoing that was so clear and obvious during the last crisis, the, the kind of the housing bubble, very few, if any, went to jail for what, what happened. And so there were very few consequences. And so things are just being kicked down the can or kicking down the can again. And that's also not very helpful, uh, I think. Well, that's an interesting point because I'd say is, is that usually when you get these uh, speculative bubbles, is, uh, I think you, you get the morality play is, is that conservatives might say something about this is that we don't like speculation because it it, uh, it tells us that or it doesn't reinforce the idea of hard work and putting sweat on your brow to be able to uh, you know generate your income. And liberals don't like uh, speculative bubbles because they'll say is, is that this just shows capitalism, uh, you know, greed and the avarice of, of speculation. In this particular case, we actually have conservative and Republican legislators in the United States saying, we have to investigate why uh, for Robin Hood, they actually cut off trading for certain stock names. So here you have both conservatives and liberals saying this is that we need to understand why Robin Hood was denied access to trading while larger right. traders w were still able to trade those particular names. Yeah. Now, yeah. this made perfect sense when you look at the capital requirements for clearing from DTC, which is the you know the clearing for equity stocks, but it's interesting. Instead of sort of bashing these retail investors, we actually have people saying, is that, "Well, we need to investigate why they weren't allowed to be able to do sure. what they've been doing for the last couple of days before that." Right. No, I mean it raises so many questions. One of my questions, just to hear your perspective on is that we've had a few bubble. Uh, I mean, 1929 comes to mind. For those who were around in 1989, they'll know that Japan had their own bubble. We all remember probably 1999, the tech bubble, and then we had the housing bubble in 2008. I know maybe it's too early to say that this is a bubble overall uh, in terms of the equity markets, although it feels some like somewhat like that, at least to me. But you know, how is this, or is it, in your opinion, I mean, is this different or is it just exactly kind of the same pattern we're seeing playing out, but just in a slightly different way, different segment of the financial markets? Well, it's interesting because there are similarities in the pattern of, of what you sort of see. You have the memes and stories and narratives of people in, entering into the market, trading. You have a boom, you have euphoria. We haven't had the profit taking and the panic yet. But a lot of times when you have bubbles, there's what, what is called at first a displacement. There's the bubble occurs because we don't understand the value of some new technology that sort of enters into the market or we don't understand uh, how a tool is, is is used. Perfect example, the tech bubble. This is the, the bubble got out of hand because there was a euphoria about all this new technology that was going to change the world. Then we realized this is that eyeballs and clicks don't translate into dollars. It does sudden is that now we change the euphoria into panic and we're going the other way. The housing market is, is that for a lot of people, you'd say like, well, I've got new technology I can use. I can get uh, home equity loans off my home. I've got the new technology of securitization of you know, mortgage credit in new ways uh, in tranching. Uh, while it had been around for a while, it was now taken to an extreme. So there was displacement of what is the value of assets. There's new technology in the 1920s. And so that you start this where, uh, process in place. Here with GameStop and some of the others is that we don't really have the new technology. What we have is, is people trading off of expectations of what may or may not happen from the pandemic or when it will end. So... What we've seen, especially in the fall and more recently, is, is that bad companies turn into good companies because bad companies that have had you know, extraordinary uh, declines in their cash flow that don't look profitable are almost like zombie companies that they sh shouldn't be around. The assumption would be is that, that well, if we lift the, uh, the lockdown, pandemic goes away, the worst should become the best very quickly. So I want to play off of that uh, that switching 
between uh, off and on. And I think that that's what we're sort of seeing in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I was thinking of, which is just the whole role of short sellers. Um, again, it's not an area I know too much about, but I do think there are different kind of short sellers. Those that I've noticed in my career have really been people who, and you have to choose your words carefully because um, there, I think there's a fine line between the good and the bad, as there is in so many things. But, but you do have people who have, through short selling, exposed wrongdoing, exposed fraud, exposed other things that should not happen. So that's kind of one side of, of that spectrum. Then you have the kind of the maybe the long short equity funds where maybe for the most part it's kind of just part of the day-to-day -day business. There's nothing too malicious about it. And then you probably also have people who take on some companies, they put on their shorts, and then they tell the whole world about things, whether it's true or not. And they're probably not the most well-respected people on that sort of side of the table. But in some ways, and you probably know much more about this than I do, short selling also serves a function of creating liquidity and, and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm my most concern from what's happening at the moment is just that we, uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm worried about how the quote unquote marketplace where we can come and we can express our views through normal investing, how that may change either through regulation or from more of this shenanigans, quote unquote shenanigans, I'm not taking sides here, but how do you see the role of short sellers going forward? Well, if my children were back in kindergarten and I had to do show and tell, I'd hate to have, and come to daddy day and say, what's your career? I, I never want to be saying that I was a short seller. Right. Is that Surprisingly is that even though we have a speculative melt-up, even though we have a crowd swarming, buying and pushing these stocks well beyond what seems to be reasonable, is that in some sense, it's still the short seller that's being told us is that, well, they're just giving it to the giving it to the man <laughs> giving it right. to the short seller so so surprisingly that even even now is is that they're they're actually still disparaged the interesting part in this particular case is is, is that uh, not whether rational or uh, how how what motives you want to give is that the robin hood investors were able to process and see things that maybe other investors didn't focus on as much in the sense is that, that they looked at the large short interest yeah. and they saw is that if, for example in uh, in gamestop the uh short interest was over a hundred percent of the outstanding float in the stock right. so so you know that those people are going to have to at least they're going to have to cover those and buy back those shares and this is that and if you can push the the stock higher is that you can actually create a situation where the the short is is going to have to be squeezed if they have to sell out then they're going to have to they're going to have to go out and buy that stock back and so you could sort of see where was the focus of the attention. It was for all of the stocks that had some of the highest proportion of the short interest relative to outstanding float. So you'd say like, well, why was this speculative excesses in these stocks and not some other names? Well, literally is the people at the end of the year, they look through the, the stocks that had the greatest short interest relative to the outstanding float. And that's where they put their focus of their attention say were were this crowd that smart you know i don't know but but they but there was a method to the madness yeah and as i alluded to in the beginning i think the crowd was smarter than people may think but it may be just a subset that was really smart and they managed to get a lot of people in on it so to speak you on one side you could say you know fair game i mean they just picked up information that other people maybe should have picked on you could say that those hedge funds that have been caught did not do their homework they did not manage their risk because risk management in many ways is imagining the unimaginable that's what we get paid for and of course we as trend followers 
we use shorts as much as we use longs. I mean, right. it's it's a completely normal thing for us. And we're not considered short sellers. We just recognize that markets move both up and down and we want to participate in both directions. So for us as a as an sub subset of the hedge fund industry, being long and short has been from day one because of the instruments we trade, futures. And also, I just want to add one thing, which I think is so important. And that is, even though that the financial markets may have seen some kind of shockwaves going through them in the last few days, futures markets have yet again just proven to be completely normal, future, you know, super liquid, no issues. And so, again, I think, you know, it's a testament to the instruments that we trade, but it may be a little bit of a yellow light to some people who who have gone outside these traditional futures markets where so far it has been fine right but now we've seen what happens if you get caught in a short squeeze well you know i think the important point you have is that there are bubbles and then there are bubbles and i think that uh, this could be a canary in the coal mine but at the same time is is that if you go back to you know the old study the great stories about uh, tulip mania the reality is, is that it had no effect on on you know the uh, the Dutch economy is is that it was very localized and so so there was no economic spillover. So GameStop by itself is that there, there'll be winners and losers, but in some sense there there may not be a spillover. And so from a Fed Treasury perspective, the focus is that is there a bubble in the larger market as opposed to a market. But I think that, you know, the important part is this is that from a listener's perspective is, is that are there lessons that I should learn from what I've seen in the last week going forward? So we could talk about history, but, it, you know, if I sort of say, that's great, but t- tell me what I need to know. <laughs> and in some yeah. sense, this is that the important part is, is that if you're a trend follower, if you're a momentum trader, is that you have to realize that they're also subject to momentum crashes. And what we mean by that is, is that there can be quick reversals in momentum. Uh, and we saw this in November for, for those who trade, you know, long, short, you know, uh, cross-market mo- momentum, where you, you, you look at momentum from a whole range of stocks, you buy the top decile of stocks that are ha- showing the strongest momentum, and then you sell short the ones that have the lowest momentum. If that reverses, you could have a momentum crash. If you're a trend follower, this is that you could be coming along and you buy into a trend. You might have bought into a trend at even some of these local stocks. And then there could be a crash because the, the crowd, the sentiment, uh, momentum changes. So so one is, is that whenever you buy into a, uh, a momentum or trend, what's your exit strategy? Now, the exit strategy could be based on a model. It says that if the price uh, does X, then I'm going to reverse in my, my trend. If it, if it moves through a shorter term moving average, it, it, I might sort of say that's my time to exit or reverse trades. But at the very least, that there could be the potential for model failure. There could be the potential for uh, momentum crashes. So therefore, you got to have an exit. And then so the the blunt instrument of getting out is a is a stop loss. This is it. Said, so I don't know what's going on. My model, I don't know what my model's telling me, or my model's giving me a different signal, but I've lost X percent. I get out. So, so the second lesson I think that needs to be learned is this is that you got to know the rules of the game. Okay. That's the uncertainty that could really hurt you in a, in a ways that you didn't think about because it's not the focus of your attention. Rules of the game. If I was a Robin Hood trader and all of a sudden I'm trading these stocks, and all of a sudden my my brokerage firm, you know, tells me I can't can't trade alongside. Well, I could either hold or I could get out, but I can't trade from one side of, for a list of stocks. Okay, so like, how is that at all fair? Your, your reaction you find out is is that, well. Brokerage firms can do these kind of things. So, so one, uh, and I think the easiest for futures traders to one to realize is, is margin changes. We know that if volatility goes up, and it goes up significantly, and if it's trending in one direction, there's a good chance that there's going to be an increase in margin. So the cost of trading goes up a lot higher. Now that has market impact effects. Is that 
generally what happens is, is that increasing margin is supposed to break speculative excess, yet at the same time, it also takes out liquidity. So you could actually still get more volatility. So, but here's a case is that for margins in you know, GameStop and some of these other names, if you're selling short options, they are asking for, in some cases, three times the, the premium associated with the option. If you're buying a stock, so you're, you might have to put up all of the, all of the money up front for for a purchase of the stock, so it has to be in your in your account, so that you you can't sort of buy and say like, well, I'll, I'll wire you the money. So, are these fair or unfair? The fact that they can change the rules of the game uh, when it happens to you, say like, how can this happen? But you got to read the fine print. And if I was any hedge fund CTA right now. I would actually sort of saying, I got to start the paperwork now to find a second prime broker or second broker, because if this can happen in this case, who knows what's going to happen if we have a larger market, you know, disturbance or meltdown, you know, I, I need to make sure that I have alternative sources of where I could execute trades and do my business. Which actually, I mean, it's a, that's a great point, Mark. I mean, it also makes it unfortunately harder i think for the the smaller guy again if they have to now go out and find you know additional brokers and so on and so forth which is why i sometimes and people will maybe wonder why i sometimes say you know for many people it is actually better to pay someone an experienced trend follower for example to do the investments for them rather than trying to do it themselves even if we spend a lot of time trying to educate people about how they could do it themselves, unfortunately, the barriers to entry in this game are not going down, if anything. And I think what you just described is is um, is is important to realize. And of course, the truth is that with CTAs in general, we might only have one clearing broker, but we usually have several executing brokers where we can get our business done, and and then. You know the trades are given up to the to the clearing broker. So valid points in, in instead. But you do men, you mentioned one thing which I think is also worth commenting on, and that is potentially the role of options in all of this. Because what we have seen in recent times, whether it's the last few months or whatever, we have seen that there are more options traded now than there are underlying stocks. And I wouldn't be surprised that. A lot of this buying pressure has come from either people buying the call options, you know, the private, quote unquote, private investors. And then obviously, at some point, the people who sold them the options, they have to cover their shorts, so to speak, and, and so on and so forth. So, so the fact that volumes of options uh, have gone up so much, I think you say maybe something, a new dimension to all of this and how the markets work in general no the the uh, buying power that uh, retail investors now have with options is much stronger than what we had before so they, they're making up a greater percentage of option trading option trading in general is up across the board retail is in, uh, stocks have been much higher than what we've seen before it, it is interesting is, is that if you go back to market pundits they thought well with the introduction of etfs they'll say that there are not going to be any retail trading whatsoever. Is is that you, there's no need to do this, and yet we've seen an explosion of retail trading on individual stocks. We've seen an explosion of retail trading on the option side, and uh, once again, is this is that the key macro issue is the fact that more option trading and more uh, ties more market behavior with volatility. And what we've seen back in February of 2018, when we had the volatility meltdown, what we've seen here in, in uh, with option trading in general is is that you've got a uh, if you're a market maker, you've got a hedge. Then you create, then you have gamma risk. Prices start moving uh, large. Now you got to sort of readjust your 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 delta hedges on your option book. So that means you're going to be more sensitive to volatility, and so. Markets become more sensitive to volatility when there's more option trading. When people are looking for rebalancing, you're going to get more sensitivity to volatility. So 
volatility is is become more ever present in how markets will move in a macro basis. And the funny thing is, of course, that both you and I know that options have been around forever, right? I mean, the, the, this is not a new instrument. What is new potentially is that we all got caught in a pandemic where people then were forced to be at home. They couldn't go to the casinos and gamble. They couldn't gamble on sports events because they were canceled. And they found this instrument called options, potentially, I'm speculating here, but there seems to be some link between uh, the explosion of options trading and the fact that we have um, more time at home maybe than we used to have. Well, this goes back to the whole idea when we talked about the uh, three-sided triangle for bubbles. This is it in right. marketability. This is that, again, this is that uh, because of technology, it's a lot easier to uh, trade options. You could trade them on your phone. The cost of trading options is mu uh, uh, much less. So you can be able to, you know, do this at, at you know, you can buy one option. And if the cost of uh, a, a brokerage cost is very low and you could do it on the phone, all of a sudden this is that you can make this more marketable. It's, it's more accessible than it was before. And so all of a sudden now you've created to be able new potential buyers. And if it's hard to sort of say, okay, yes, is now everyone's at home. So they say, I can't, I can't watch sports. So I'll trade options. I, I'm a little, I, I don't know whether that's exactly true. It's a great story, but uh, in some senses, that certainly is, is that if we've reduced the cost of transacting, then uh, people will transact more. So there are certain truisms in economics that we always know how this is that I lower the costs and I'm gonna I'm gonna do more of it, whatever it is. True. <laughs> true. Well, I mean, speaking of just picking up on what you said, I mean, speaking about being home, speaking about watching sports and all of that, last night, actually, I was waiting to um, to watch the country of my of my birth country, Denmark, play the semifinal in the world championship in, in handball. Hopefully people know what handball <laughs> is. It's not that well known outside some countries. But anyways, I was a little bit early. And so I switched on the the Danish, this is important, the Danish television. And suddenly one of our previous guests on the podcast shows up, Michael Green, very popular guests. And this was apparently also a program that the Danish television was making about what was going on. And Mike, of course, one of the things he talked about, which is something he's written about a lot and that he spoke about also on our podcast episode with him, was the role of passive versus active. And I didn't see all of the conversation, but what he did say, which was kind of new to, to me, was that he his models at the moment was predicting that within a few years, very few years, passive will be definitely bigger than active overall. And so when you do have the next crisis that comes, he said pretty much that he feared, or his models predict, that we could have a crisis from which we will never recover. Just from that change, dramatic change, you see when you have market participants or flows that are quote-unquote price insensitive, where it's not about value, it's not about the price, it's just about how much do I have to buy or how much do I have to sell. I'm sure you're obviously familiar with with that side of things as well. Well, it, it's a, in some sense, I, taking with the theme that it's a cold weekend, I'm not going to be on fire and, and come up with these extreme, <laughs> extreme views. But in some sense, this is that markets change. They always will change. This is something that John Henry would always pound the table and talk about so that we've, you know, our trend following presupposes changes. So, so you're always, you know, got to be prepared for it. We'll adjust and adopt, but now what will happen is, is that I think that when we have more passive investors and they're in ETF, it's going to be a lot easier for people to exit the market the next time we have a crisis relative to you know the great financial crisis. This is that I, with a click of a button, I could be able to sell my basket of ETFs in a stock market. The click of the button, I could uh, sell my bond ETF. 
And I think that this is one of the big issues where, again, you're going to have to redefine print because what happens if, let's say, some because of ETFs or mutual funds that they restrict the selling of mutual funds, you know, because they say, well, we're having a liquidity event. And I think that this is going to turn people off from the market if, let's say, they're not going to be able to exit their mutual funds or their passive investments. And, and, and so it's not just ETFs, this is that we have mutual fund structures that are passive. And I think that what happens is, is that uh, we see that people can change expectations very quickly and for individual stocks based on you know what might be going on message boards. This is that is this telling us something about what happens if people change their expectations about the market? as opposed to a market. Could we start to have people start to move out of markets now say, oh, it's too large, it can't happen. Arbitrage flows would sort of equilibrate the markets. This is that we've already seen a Mar uh, March meltdown uh, less than a year ago, okay? We're still living in this environment of from March meltdown where the government actually bought ETFs is that we've seen other foreign markets, you know, get involved in stock markets. You know, you're in Switzerland. This is it. Ever look at the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank and look at all this? Don't look. Uh, Don't look. <laughs> it's amazing the amount of stocks they hold. This is that they're a big investor in Apple and Microsoft. This is that the next crisis is going to be different than the last crisis. The one thing we know for sure is that we've prepared ourselves to ensure that we're not uh, that we can protect ourselves from a housing crisis we're probably not going to have a housing crisis this next time around we've ensured that we can uh, protect ourselves from a from some types of bubbles but our next crisis is going to be different yes you talked about and this is just jumping all around the 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 place nothing too structured here but i mean you talked about people's need for maybe looking into how many prime brokers they have in order to have safeguards in place. I can't help worrying a little bit, and I hate to say it, what about safeguards of exchanges? I mean, what if what if, what if if we see something happening to the exchanges that we all trade on, which is a very few number of exchanges really that handles all of this volume? I mean, there really aren't much of an alternative for you to get out if the exchange is closed. And that worries me, I have to say. Well, the interesting part, if you go back to, and, and I, I was in Chicago and I was, uh, I was working at the Mercantile Exchange for the 87 uh, market crash. And so, so I was in the exchange the night that uh, you're looking at where, where was all the money going to come from? And so you had a number of, right. of banks that had to sort of uh, funnel money to the exchange. You had multiple exchanges. And in some senses that the crisis was is because you had to make sure that margin money was moving from one account to another. You had to make sure that money was coming from one exchange to another through different banks. So the plumbing was very important and the plumbing was very complex. And we didn't really, uh, I think, fully appreciate how complex the plumbing was. It was in 87 and we didn't have the technology back then. Run forward is, is, is that uh, we've now sort of, uh, you know, sort of consolidated the plumbing. We've got one big pipe. <laughs> it could right. be into the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It could be into uh, Euronext, but we have a limited number of exchanges now. So in some senses that we've reduced the number of pipes that we have moving around, but we have one large, a uh, couple of large pipes or a couple of large bends or center places, which are the clearing houses. So we've eliminated one problem of multiple exchanges and can one a smaller exchange go under because of their practices but we've increased the risk because we've added it all into one exchange or one place so that means is that uh, there's you know generally if you have only one exchange or, or a limited number of exchanges you may have less innovation you have the probability of failure may uh, of any one uh, goes down, but in some senses, the, but the probability of the system going up. And this is an area that I probably have been looking at more recently is, is it with respect to model building, but this ap applies to uh, financial systems. What type of resilience engineering 
have you put in place in the system? And resilience, and, and there's actually a, a, uh, you know, it's a Danish uh, professor who's worked on this uh, area of resilience in, engineering. And the f- focus is, 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 it, is it how can you adapt or how do you protect yourself from the un- unexpected? In some senses, that if we had Nassim Taleb on, he would talk about anti-fragile systems as opposed to fragile systems. Now, the anti-fragile term or meme hasn't really taken on. Uh, I think people read it, and then you know, sort of, it's been more of a throwaway. Is is that even though I think it's a great, you know, term, resilience may may be a better way to describe it. We, we want to build a system that can adapt to new things going on, new events? And do you have flexibility and adaptability in your systems in the way you behave so that you can create resilience? And our biggest fear is that large institutions are less resilient than what we expect or need. Yeah, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but... It's almost like it would be a good idea to have all these markets trading on some kind of blockchain, not that I know much about it, but have kind of an alternative that is not centralized for you to be able to uh, hedge your positions should something happen. The challenge, of course, is that what we've seen is a huge consolidation of exchanges in recent years. So we've actually ended up with very few. And of course, we as clients of these exchanges are kind of also to blame because we only want to trade where there's most volume. So we consolidate the volume with one and we're all going to rush to that. I mean, so new initiatives find it very hard to compete. Although I do know from um, Eric Townsend's new podcast um, that, of course, there are new exchanges coming, also location-wise, not necessarily in the U.S., and maybe, and hopefully, maybe they can actually create some alternatives in many markets so that we can, again, become more resilient in our way of doing or implementing our our trading, so to speak. You talked also about crowds. And, and of course, it's, it, it kind of, it's kind of funny, right, that we as practitioners of trend following would say, well, we, the reason why we're still here uh, after you know 50 years since the industry got started is because of human behavior never changes right that would be one of our arguments and maybe that's again what we're seeing now but you mentioned crowds and and so on and so forth you know the the thing that the uh, i would sort of say that you know i've been doing trend following quantitative modeling and and systematic modeling for for decades now and uh you think that over a number of decades that you wouldn't have to go back to 101. Why, why do you need to have systems? Why do you need to have rules? And yet, mm. uh, we'll probably sort of say that the first, you know, there are people who get it right away. They're already, those are the people who are already systematic investors. In some sense, there's always a crowd that are still a little bit of skeptical. I'm, I'm going to give up my authority as a discretionary trader or as discretionary investors to someone who's going to follow rules and be systematic. And so so I constantly look at, you know, okay, what do we learn from crowds and what can we do uh, or how do we reduce the risks from crowd behavior in our systematic trading? And one of the things that came came to mind or some research has come is is that it called the risky shift effect. And the risky shift effect says is that what happens is that when you put a lot of people into a room, you know, like a investment committee, and if they're not diverse, and if they're sort of thinking similarly, that they move to the extreme. So if they said that they, uh, that they want to be buyers, you put the committee together, they have a discussion, usually they'll be stronger buyers. If they're, you put the committee together and if they want to be sellers, they're going to be stronger sellers. And so, so in mm-hmm. some senses is that uh, you think that, oh, well, I like the input from a committee. Well, generally, is is that what you find out is that the committees oftentimes don't like diversity and diversity of opinion. And when you think about it, is 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 that firms will often talk about we have a strong culture, okay? But the culture means is that a lot of times that people are all thinking the same, 
the culture is not this that, well, I have a culture where everybody is arguing with everyone else, no one can agree, and we basically are sort of constantly battle for every decision. Now, that may not seem like a good idea, but in reality is, is that getting true diversity will make for better opinions and better decisions. Generally, I find is, is, is that you know committee w- work together that they move to the extreme mm. or they get more extreme. So what is, the, uh, what is the great advantage of a model? The great advantage of a model is, is, is that you're not going to get this uh, risky shift effect. It's not as though that, that I ha- if I have multiple models that I have working together, it's not that I put them all in a room that then they're going to get, they, they may all start to move together because they all come to the same conclusion, but there, they could be diverse models. They could be different models. I'm not going to have this natural movement towards extremes based on a committee effect or a group effect or a crowd effect. So, so I think the great part of systematic modeling is, is that you can constantly overcome or battle the tendencies that we have of being in a group or showing biases as a group or as an individual. Yeah. I mean, that actually is also a topic that we could certainly dig in to uh, a bit more We'll do so maybe next time you're on. I want to cover one more thing. And then even though the list is so long in terms of what we had planned to talk about, time is also of importance. So I think I'm just going to run you through this particular point, which I thought was really interesting. And then uh, there's one question that I think we need to uh, also take from uh, Jono, I think, had sent in a question. But you talked about something like building models without stops. And that's kind of completely counterintuitive to what we normally talk about because we always say, you know, having a stop is a really good idea, et cetera, et cetera. So talk to me a little bit about this thinking about building models without stops. Well, a good model should actually look at uh, at, at trying to uh, enter, but then as it moves through time, it should also sort of give signals of when you should get out, Okay. And in some senses, that that would be sort of uh, if you're building, and some mathematicians have looked at this issue, is, is is that having entry and exits that are embedded in the rules will be more optimal than sort of building a model and then saying, I will put a stop outside the model that will tell me when I'm going to turn it, uh, basically turn it off. Okay. So in some sense, a optimal model should be able to create the situations or the environments when I'm uh, I, when I can get in and my enter into the market and when I should exit the market. So a stop is in some sense is exogenous or outside the the environment. Now, in some sense, I think uh, you know stops can be a very good thing because in some sense it's saying is that this is a, the ultimate way in which I could say there is an error in my uh, my model. I have. I've lost confidence or the market is doing something that was not picked up by my model. And so it, it provides a timeout or a, uh, or a stop to get out of the uh, market. So I'm somewhat conflicted because in some sense, I love to build models that tell me when I should enter and exit and don't need stops. At the same time as is it, I think that stops can be able to serve as a, uh, as a, insurance policy that if say if if i did something wrong where my model is not picking up the environment as it currently is exists that it can tell me how to get out of a marketplace and and sort of restart yeah i mean the way i think about just very sort of simply of stops is also that yeah i mean it's kind of your as you say it's kind of your insurance of getting out at a at a at a certain point on the other hand, that insurance may not be free, meaning that if you were waiting until your signals changed instead of just being stopped out and going neutral, if you take a very simple kind of breakout model, then, of course, we know that stops sometimes can be part of why you get whipsawed uh, in and out of positions more often than actual signal changes. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've interviewed one manager many, many, many years ago who basically had built a model with very, very few inputs and where there were absolutely no stops. 
Now, and I also think that, you know, stops, of course, we know that you can easily do trend following without quote unquote stops. I mean, that's actually what we do at Don, but we have other ways of managing the risk. But um, it's an interesting topic. It might relate a little bit to the question we got from Jono that I want to read and then want to hear your your view on. Uh, Jono writes that I'm an upcoming trend follower. I back tested my system. Very, very simple breakout strategy. Simpler than you can think of. But I came across one issue, and here it comes. I've I've seen that trend followers tend to add to positions as the trend develops, maybe by one ATR or two. But I've noticed that this method adding creates a lot more losses due to the volatility of the market, and the system end up at a small win or break even during testing in the last ten years. Is my back testing wrong? Or what is your opinion? Do you tr- tend to add to your positions as the trend develops, or do you leave it as one entry and trail your stop? So, how do you <laughs> think about these things, Mark? That is, a, we could spend an hour on just that one topic. I know. So, uh, I, I can sort of say that, uh, that there, uh, again, there are different ways in which you sort of you build models. This is that. Uh, there are well-known trend followers that I know that put on full positions as soon as they got a signal. And and the idea is that once you decide that you're enter into a trend, put your full position on, you put all your, your money at risk. Okay. And we've tested that. It looks pretty good. Is this it? That, uh, there are others who sort of say like, well, as I grow more confident with my models, or if I have multiple models, maybe I should add more positions on as that's consistent with the confidence that I have. So part of it is that you have to go back to the initial assumptions of how you build a model. So let's take a a very simple case. If I have one model, then I probably, and that's all I use, I probably should sort of say, I say, put your full positions on, then let, let them ride it. So now what happens if I use multiple models? So I have one model that's a breakout system and another model that's, let's say, you know, just a moving average trend, okay? Now I'm going to get two signals, okay? In some sense is that since those signals may not come at the same time, if I have multiple models, then I might sort of say, well, I should add into my positions because now I have, I'm getting two signals that increases my confidence on a trend for that market, So I should add two positions. So some is, how do you build, uh, are you one model or multiple models? Are you sort of include some idea of what is confidence in your models? And and I think those are sort of questions you have to ask when you start your building before we can really answer the issue of how you should scale in or scale up. Yeah, and on top of that, you could say that even if you just used one approach, you know, one model, whether it be breakout, whether it be moving averages, etc. You certainly people would often hear us talk about that within each of those categories, we would use multiple look back periods or multiple sensitivities, whatever it might be, so that we end up actually having lots of small steps. I'm curious if you remember, if you can talk about it, what did you do at John Henry? I've always never quite know what kind of trend follower John Henry was off trend following what John Henry was doing and was it super simple was it you know more complex it was uh, uh, fairly simple and you'll sort of say and but then there were constantly developments and enhancements to improve it which added some levels of complexity but we'll sort of say that the, you know the original early models were very simple and it was you know very you know more long term trend following that would be able to enter and exit the market. And some of that was actually when you talk about the marketability of markets, a lot of it had to do is is that most people were long-term simple trend followers back in the early 80s for the simple reason the brokerage costs were so high relative to your trading. So you have to remember that your round turn that you would be trading would be you know, close to a hundred dollars a round turn. So you, yeah. you can't imagine like uh, what trading is costs now relative to what it was in the eighties. So in those situations, this is that like, 
of course you couldn't come up with a complex model and scale in and, and have short-term uh, breakout systems for simple reasons. The, you, the only person you would be making rich would be the broker on this situation. Yeah. As the costs have come down, you can be able to add complexity. You could add in more scaling. You could add in more models to be able to to trade. So, so you could sort of say that structure drives models. I mean, the structure of the markets. The cost structure changes. You can then be able to do things that you didn't do before. Yeah, but still, and this is what's fascinating, really, is that those simpler approaches that worked back in the 70s and the 80s, et cetera, et cetera, they still work. I mean, last year, I think they worked really well from what I can tell. And even though it is more difficult to uh, to stick to them now because you've, we've had sort of longer periods of time where maybe they haven't worked so well, I would still argue that they, they work just fine. And if you can live with the you know, lumpiness of your returns and and don't look for a straight line, probably in the long run, they will be as good as um, many of the more complex ways of doing trend following, be my guess. Well, that's the one thing that if you look back through trend following history across decades or centuries, is that it's probably as, as a risk premium strategy, momentum slash trend following has consistently been the best strategy to follow. This is that there have been ups and downs. There have been periods when it's done worse. There's pe- periods when it's done better. But consistently, it's been it's tended to work. What we have found, especially in the post global financial crisis, is that the signals may have gotten a little worse. Maybe they have improved in some years, but in general, this is that. It's very important on how you structure the portfolio. If you take the same set of signals and you, if you don't scale the positions, right, when you build a portfolio of of positions, if you don't uh, take into account correlation, volatility or such, is that that could have a huge impact on your Sharpe ratio, a huge impact on your overall portfolio performance. And I think that... uh, the most of the advancements for trend followers over the last 10 years may not have been with extracting better signals, but extracting more alpha or, or making the portfolio construction stronger by taking the principles of finance. And that's where, you know, I think that the people who have not incorporated good portfolio construction have suffered. Those that have done better portfolio construction have, in general, done better over the last 10 years. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point and a great point to maybe wind down our conversation for today. Let me talk a little bit about what the month looks like since it is the end of January. And uh, although I don't have data from yesterday, Friday, it is as of Thursday evening, I do think yesterday was probably a down day, so uh, you need to subtract a little bit from the numbers that I have. But the BTOP50 index, as well as actually the SOCGEN CTA index, uh, was down as of Thursday, Thursday, 0.44%. So slightly down, nothing too dramatic. The trend index was pretty flat as of Thursday, but I have a feeling it might get a little bit worse uh, before the month is... uh, completely over and then you have the short terms traders index which actually didn't do so well in january was down 1.53 percent as of thursday now my own trend barometer that measures the trendiness in a portfolio of 44 markets ended at a level of 45 meaning that 45 percent of the 44 markets were in a trending state and that's actually completely a neutral level I would consider 40 to 50 as being completely neutral, meaning you have no idea if the trend followers are going to end up a little bit up or a little bit down. So it kind of is in line with what the numbers I've just quoted for. MSCI World Index is going to be finishing down 1% or thereabouts, 105. And uh, also, interestingly enough, the World Government Bond Index is going to be down about 78 basis points, which, of course, 
poses yet another challenge with something that I would expect we're going to see more often, and that that is this quote unquote positive correlation between bonds and stocks, especially when stocks go down, bonds don't necessarily come to the rescue as often as they used to. Now, before we finish, Mark, we do talk about if there's anything in particular in terms of a, could be a podcast, could be an interview, could be a white paper, something that has been interesting that we've caught in terms of our day-to-day lives and Although we may not have talked about this before, Mark, but is there anything you've come across recently that you thought, hmm, interesting piece of content? Well, the one thing I mentioned earlier, and I think you could get the sources from, uh, if you just Google, resilience engineering. So okay, the, the best ideas often are come from cross-disciplinary. You know, so if I look at psychology, look at other engineering, and maybe that could give me some some you know, idea that I didn't have before. So, so I think that uh, maybe the next time I come on is, is that the, if everyone could do their homework out there, think about resilience engineering <laughs> for February, yeah. and I think you'll be better off for when the next crisis comes. Absolutely. And actually, Mark, I think you and I have talked about that you might write a, a little bit of a, a narrative or an email that I can share with my email list. So, or, And so I think Mark might share some interesting things. And so if you want to be on my email list, if you already have already downloaded the guide that I've created or an ebook that I created, don't worry, you're going to be on the list. But other than that, if you're not on any of my uh, email list, make sure you are. Just go to the top traders unplugged dot com website and and sign up and then uh, you should get whatever we put together uh, in the next few days. I also want to mention that next week Rob is back, so make sure that your questions come in in time and you can of course email them to info at toptradersonplot dot com and we do do our best to bring them up. Also, if they're related specifically to uh, to one of the uh, the usual suspects here, whether it's Rob or Jerry or Moritz or Mark, I mean, we will try and obviously put them in the right episode. And um, if you want to help us out, of course, you can always leave a rating and review. We haven't seen many rating and reviews the last uh, week or so. So if you could take a little bit of your time out, um, that would be so appreciated. Other than that, I think I'm just going to... And Oh, by the way, I didn't share my resource. I've completely forgotten about that. So my uh, resource this week or, or, or interesting piece of content that I came across was actually a YouTube interview by Daniel DiMartino Booth, who's been on this podcast as a guest. And she was interviewing a guy called Vikram Mancharamani. And he has... He makes... He's, a, I think, a professor or a lecturer and um you know a phd from from mit back in you know back in the day but he's written some books and one of the i think his most recent books is called think for yourself that's not the resource it's the interview you can find on youtube i thought was quite interesting and actually he does these predictions for another year uh, or every year he does a prediction and his 2021 predictions um, which are very far reaching and has nothing to do with trend following really I just thought they were interesting. They range from te- technology to China to many things. So anyways, I thought it was inspirational. I don't know if it's inspirational, but it was interesting. Let's put it that way to uh, listen to what he had to say. He was a new person in my world in terms of uh, resources. So uh, anyways, and always good fun to watch Danielle DiMartino Booth and her opinions as well are also very valid. With that, from Mark and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you next week. In the meantime, be well and stay safe. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review, and be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.